All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming, picking this security talk over the other one, which is <laughs> at the same time. Um, but uh, so this is going to be defense in depth, lessons learned from securing 100,000 Drupal sites. So um, I'm Luke Probasco. I'm with uh, Townsend Security. Um, David Strauss with Pantheon. And Chris Deitzel with Cellular Media. So we come at this from multiple perspectives, and that's why the three of us are up here. Uh, myself, I'm a Drupal architect. Uh, I've been working with Drupal for uh, just about six years now, or just over. Um, and from a site builder, themer, uh, and Drupal architect, I'll give you some insights. And uh, I come at, uh, from my earlier experience as a Drupal site architect and in, uh, infrastructure architect, as well as uh, much more recently, um, the um, architecture of Pantheon to uh, prevent compromise of the platform. And I'm uh, with Townsend Security, and so uh, I bring a perspective of compliance and, and data security um, and basically security from an agency perspective. All right, uh, I like this one. So um, this is the FBI in the States uh, basically says there are only two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that will be, even that is merging into one category, those that have been hacked and will be again. And um, working for a security company, this is something that we see. Uh, it's actually kind of interesting uh, to see we can almost predict breaches uh, at our company in the States because you have a certain amount of time where you don't have to report it, but we can see people coming to us and wanting to learn about encryption technologies, and it's actually quite interesting when uh, they come around twice. So, And I would further subdivide those who have been hacked into two categories, those that know that they've been hacked and those that don't. <laughs> yeah, so son of a breach. Is it going? Is it? Ah, there we go. Now, son of a breach. Uh, you cannot afford to be hacked. Uh, the average cost of a data breach, the Ponymon Institute uh, does studies every year. Uh, it was $3.79 million per breach, or $154 a record. Um, that puts businesses out of business. It, it's just something that uh, should be not taken lightly. Um, and so far this year, uh, there have been uh, 533 breaches and millions of records exposed. So if you just even add, you know, that $154 or even, you know, cut that in half, that's a lot of money. And so um, uh, also a lot of uh, these breaches have been by increasingly sophisticated external actors uh, where everything from uh, Russian federal officials all the way to um, dissident groups uh, are able to now fund attacks that are based on either buying uh, unknown exploits all the way through uh, paying for access to botnets to take down sites because of load all the way to um, employing those bot sets to exercise known vulnerabilities in software so that it's more than ever before, if a site has a vulnerability and it's known, uh, the chance that it will actually get eventually tested for that vulnerability and exploited on that is actually pretty high now. So you will be hacked. Let's just all get that out there right now and move on from it. But we don't want to just, you know, go through doom and gloom and have this be a uh, a session where you guys leave um, angry and upset and, and scared for what you're doing. Uh, we want to give you some practical advice. And so, um, unless your site is permanently offline or on your local computer, um, you're going to get hacked and let's figure out how we can uh, prevent that from happening. And if it does, uh, what steps we're going to take. Yeah, so uh, just if you want to rewind there real quick, I have an audience participation here. Just to show how often data breaches happen, uh, raise your hand if you've ever had your bank send you a new credit card or get a hold of you to say, hey, you're going to need a new credit card. <laughs> yeah, this guy. Yeah, it, that, that just, uh, just goes to that point. But another point that I, I do want to make on here, um, we often hear, you know, I'm too small for a hacker to care about. And that is, you couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, this that falls into the category of wishful thinking. And in fact, the, the, in the States, the FBI reports that smaller private companies are increasingly the focus of cyber criminals and are experiencing significant financial losses. Uh, and here's what uh, an FBI consultant says. I'll just read it here real quick. 
Uh, time and again, I have heard small business owners say that they have nothing to worry about because they are too small to interest cyber criminals. Instead, small businesses are exactly who the criminals are targeting for two primary reasons. In the criminal's mind, why go after large companies directly when easier access can be attained through small business vendor relationships? Uh, secondly, since small businesses have less financial and IT resources, criminals know they are less compromise ready and tend to be less resilient. And we've seen concrete evidence of this on Pantheon where we've actually seen agency accounts be targeted for compromise when they're actually trying to also compromise the sites that those agencies are working on. So how do we build a security consciousness? That's the first step that you have to do. You, before you touch any code, before you touch your servers, you need to start thinking with a security mindset. So let's go over uh, the anatomy of a typical breach. So uh, it's really important when looking at how to prevent breaches, what the typical ones have as factors. And uh, in a moment, we'll also go over some of the ones that are not typical of breaches. But I couldn't emphasize more that almost every breach involves some sort of human element. Some person's been tricked. Some person has not taken care of their personal security well enough, or their organizational IT has not taken care of their security well. Um, if you look at, say, for example, Sony's hack, uh, it didn't involve a direct uh, line from a vulnerability to organization-wide compromise. They compromised uh, someone placed highly in the IT organization who had access to password lists, and then they had that um, go on to compromise the systems overall for almost every computer at Sony Entertainment. And um, that emphasizes one of the other issues with attacks, which is they often are a sort of festering wound, uh, which is that a foot kind of gets in the door in some place, and then that is used to build bigger and bigger compromises uh, of an organization as uh, they maintain that foothold. Uh, going back to the Sony attack, uh, you'll notice that they didn't instantly go to uh, full compromise. It took over a year of sitting in those systems, exploring those systems, uh, compromising the right individuals and their access to be able to pull off the uh, sort of magnum opus attack that they did against that organization. So shutting things down early and preventing human error are some of the uh, most prudent things that can happen for preventing attacks. Also important is to recognize what is not uh, important uh, in terms of attacks, uh, in terms of what we typically see. Um, modern hashes and encryption are extremely strong when they're employed correctly. Even following the Snowden breach, uh, uh, breach um, data from the NSA, um, they've listed many of the current modern encryption methods and hash systems as well beyond their ability to compromise. Um, and to emphasize like how difficult it is to compromise some of this modern encryption, um, back in 1996, uh, Bruce Schneier wrote about how much energy you would have to harness to do a brute force attack against modern keys. If you, uh, how many people in here have heard of Dyson Spheres? Good. Okay. So for the people who aren't familiar, a Dyson Sphere is this kind of idea of putting something around an entire sun and capturing almost all the energy that that sun is producing and then harnessing it as a sort of super advanced civilization. And if you put a Dyson sphere around our sun um, and captured all of its energy for something like 30 or 100 years, you still would not be able to, to perform a brute force attack against a 256-bit key, even if you built a theoretically perfect computer that harnessed every bit of energy you, you, uh, you captured from that just to walk through the keys. It's that hard to do a true brute force attack. So when it's employed properly, this is typically not the, the genesis of a hack on systems. Um, and also, typically, unless you're looking at nation state level actors, you're not seeing a lot of secret vulnerabilities that don't have fixes available. Even in the case of the Drupal get an attack, which was even on Drupal.org for quite some time before it was publicly announced as a security release, uh, that had a fix, it still took hours after the public announcement of it before anyone was actually compromising it. Um, and also, like this should almost doesn't need to be said, but you're not seeing Hollywood-style attacks. You're not going to hook a computer up to a system and then say, crack the password, and then you know a bunch of green text goes by, and, and you've, you've compromised the system. So uh, it's, it's not an insurmountable problem, especially if you take some of the strategies that we have in here. 
Um, and it's also important to think about security not as a bolt-on to what you're doing as your uh, as your strategy for building sites and maintaining internal security in your organization. It needs to be a fundamental consideration of everything you do. When you build a module, you need to be thinking, how do I make this secure? When you deploy a site, you need to th be thinking, how do I do this securely? When you access your email, you need to be thinking about how you do that securely. Um, you can't just simply... Um, do all those things and then come back at the end of the month and say, uh, well, how do I fix the security of these things? Because if it's not in your mindset at the beginning, it's almost unreconcilable to, to fix it later without spending an enormous amount of time. Uh, and it's also, um, when you do that kind of fundamental approach to it, it's important to balance exactly uh, how deep that approach is. Um, there is a middle ground between complete ignorance and complete paranoia, um, and there are sort of diminishing returns as you add more and more focus on security. For every dollar or euro that you spend on focusing on security, the first few, if spent properly, can have an, an enormous benefit to your infrastructure, even if you don't want to spend that much time or money. Um, but it's important to kind of sort the priorities, and that's what we're going to be getting into uh, in this presentation. Which actually is, this uh, kind of shows a graph of like, you know, the risk reward uh, effect of um, your investment. That the first bit of investment is going to be the most effective if you target it correctly. So I'll just uh, talk just a, a brief bit here about compliance. Um, it's I'm just curious. Uh, we did this talk over in, L in uh, L.A., and probably 90% uh, of the room raised their hand, but uh, who here is working on a project that involves compliance? Yeah, okay, interesting. Um, so for those that are, are doing a project that needs to meet compliance, compliance is not optional, and in fact, I of often like to say that um, Compliance is really the low bar for data security. You should actually be doing much, much better than what compliance regulations say. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, there are several modules and services that can actually help you meet compliance. Um, so I guess we'll just kind of cruise along here. Um, and uh, next up, the security triad. Uh, this is not something we made up. CIA is not the US CIA. It uh, stands for Confidentiality, Integrity, and Availability. Uh, and the best way to educate yourself is to be thinking about all of the aspects in the triad, not just one. Um, confidentiality is roughly the equivalent to privacy. Uh, data encryption is a common method for ensuring confidentiality. User IDs and passwords constitute a standard procedure. Uh, Two-factor authentication is becoming the norm. And uh, just always err on the side of more uh, confidentiality. Uh, integrity is all about the integrity of the data. Um, so first off, uh, if you're building a module, never ever trust a user. It's just put that as your first, you know, tape it to your computer. Don't trust a user. Anything that they give you needs to be sanitized, needs to be cleaned, needs to be scraped before it goes anywhere else in the system. Um, that is going to be the first vector that somebody tries to get in. Um, and also, just you know, read write access on your servers. Make sure that you don't have you know triple sevens on your entire server, and anyone can go put any file anywhere they want. Um, make sure that you have proper read write um, on your on your servers, and you'll you'll have an integrity of your data. Oh, and also, um, one of the things that compliance typically doesn't address is uh, the availability of your data, which uh, is that um, if, um, if your website's not up, if your systems are not online, you're not getting the business value that those systems uh, provide, and that means that um, all of the security you might have layered on top of it is um, m uh, all, mostly for naught, because the, uh, it's important to balance out usability of those systems uh, as well as keeping them defended against things like denial of service attacks. Um, and, you know, you have to be able to run your website on the Internet. You can't just keep it on your local machine. So what does hacked mean? Oh, yes. Availability. Oh, oh. oh accountability. There we go. <laughs> So what does hacked mean? Um, a lot of the times uh, you see a site like this, and that's what you first think of when you see hacked. 
Um, I've had somebody come to me with a site that looks like this before, um, and it's kind of obvious that you've been hacked. Um, that's defacement. That's the easiest one to see. Uh, but as David mentioned, there's also a denial of service where um, they can just flood your, your server with so many requests that it goes offline, um, and that will have substantial um, ramifications in your, in your company. Uh, but then also there's data breaches which could go silent, and somebody can come in and take all your data out, um, grab your user data, and, uh, and do whatever they want with it. So hack does not just mean I'm going to go change something on your front page and, and put some scary text on there. So really what, what we have to do is we have to look at a defense and depth approach. Um, we always say that there is, there's nothing perfect. Um, you will never have the perfect secure um, website because it would be on your local machine. Um, but if you put up enough walls, if you put up enough gates that they have to hop through and get over, the goal is to have procedures and, and practices in place where you can shut off one of those gates um, and limit your, your exposure. Um, so having a de defense in depth means all the way from the device, the application, the computer, the network, physical, to your policies and procedures around the company. Um, these are all incorporated into security. It's not just your code. So <clears throat> how many people have had um, one of their clients email them a password for a server or anything like that? Come on. <laughs> um, I've, I have had a client say, oh, I just you know, bought XYZ server and here's the root password for it. It's like, Thank you very much. I have a lot more work to do now. Um, and so just the first piece is, you know, you can have the most secure Drupal, you can have the most secure hosting environment, but if you don't have good passwords, if you don't um, harden your SSH, it's completely worthless. Um, so protect those passwords. And there can be surprising compromises of that as well. Um, many people think that once they're using something like SSH keys that uh, you're safe. Uh, but that it hasn't actually been the case. Even in the last month, there was an exploit for Firefox that where something was found in the wild where invoking the PDF viewer in Firefox, which doesn't require any special permissions, uh, could read keys and other files off your home directory. Uh, and one of the files they had listed as one of the ones they tried to harvest off machines were SSH keys. So um, you know, put passwords on your SSH keys. Don't just encrypt your hard drive. Uh, make sure that uh, even consider using things like application sandboxing, which is pretty broadly deployed on Mac OS and Linux now, um, as well as consider using tools to isolate um, different security concerns, like using smart cards like YubiKeys for SSH. And uh, one of the most important things for vulnerability is knowing when you're vulnerable, because there are millions of applications out there, millions of points that could potentially be vulnerable, but you need to be aware of the right ones. So uh, I've kind of tailored this list to what uh, we watch primarily at Pantheon uh, for our customers and our infrastructure. And this is tailored to a combination of uh, sort of if you're deploying to Linux and you're deploying Drupal. Um, US CERT is, uh, and CERT EU are very broad information sources. They aggregate information from almost any company that or organization that wants to publish security announcements to them. Uh, they also publish um, individual announcements for particularly bad breach uh, potential for certain things. Those are free to get on. I recommend it. Uh, LWN does a roll-up of major security vulnerabilities every single day on primary Linux stack uh, systems. Uh, so that includes everything from the kernel all the way up to Apache, Nginx, and PHP. If any major distribution is releasing a major security update for any of those key components, they're publishing it. Um, that is, I think their security announcements don't even require a subscription, uh, a paid subscription. Uh, of course, the Drupal.org security team is publishing announcements. There's a standard cadence for that um, of happening on Wednesday for releases, so you don't have to watch every day. Uh, you just need to pull it up about once a week. Um, and then um, a lot of people don't know this, but you can configure package managers on systems to typically do the bare minimum for security updates only. So if you're worried about just scheduling a... Um, a sort of like yum or DNF update or an apt get update for all packages that have changes because you might break something, you can just run them with a flag that says, I just want to apply security patches. And any package you have installed that has an update for that has been flagged for security and any of the ones um, 
since the package you have installed, uh, they will get updated at that point. And um, that's a great way to balance the concerns. Um, and also uh, following some of the major vendors um, and security researchers, researchers on Twitter is going to uh, have some interesting information. I recommend adding them to a list uh, where you can basically have a feed that you can check periodically for new announcements for security. All right, I'll talk a little bit more about compliance regulations. Um, each country in the EU has its own version of PII, or per personally identifiable information and protected information. Um, and and there, there's an interesting uh, piece of, uh, of language here. Um, a confidentiality breach on a personal on personal data uh, that were encrypted with a state-of-the-art algorithm is still a personal data breach and has to be notified to the authority. Nevertheless, if the confidentiality of the key uh, is intact, the data are in principle unintelligible to any person who is not authorized. Thus, the breach is unlikely to adversely affect the data subject and therefore doesn't, does not need to be notified to the data subject. So essentially what this means is uh, you need to notify the data protection authorities in your state, but you don't need to tell customers if you have good encryption and key management. So I, I think that's an important takeaway as we're talking about securing data. Um, the next, next slide here is about PCI DSS. Um, I guess of you guys that uh, have compliance, how, how many of them, uh, how many of your projects are around PCI? A right, couple, couple of them. So, um, Real uh, quick, how many, how many people work on any sort of e-commerce site anywhere? <laughs> You're all under PCI. Uh, whether, you, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, um, just because you have a client that's asking you for PCI compliance um, doesn't mean that, uh, or if, if they're not asking you for that, it doesn't mean that they don't fall under it. Every site, unless you're using Shopify, which you wouldn't be here, um, is going to fall under some sort of PCI compliance, and you need to know about it, and you need to be able to um, address that with your clients. Yeah, and, and one thing that I always like to point out, because I have a lot of conversations with people, is that uh, you know just because your cloud service provider has a little PCI logo on it, that doesn't make you in, uh, PCI compliant. It, it's, it's great for them. Oftentimes that means that the hosting provider has what an AOC or a attestation, attestation of compliance for their platform, but it's still what you do with it that puts you in or out of compliance. It's ultimately the responsibility of the merchant itself, which is typically the website owner. So um, they have to actually make sure that everything is taken care of either by themselves or by the developer or by the platform. Um, and that requires synthesizing all the different kind of controls and security mechanisms um, that PCI requires, uh, and then they basically can fill in the report. Okay, and uh, since we're in the EU, uh, you guys are doing some pretty cool things, uh, in my opinion, on data protection and uh, requirements. I uh, borrowed these points from a Sophos blog, um, but basically uh, the EU is currently finalizing the new data protection regulation, and it will likely become a law this year. Uh, the European Parliament voted in favor of the proposed regulation by an overwhelming majority in March of 2014, and the regulation will, still needs to go through further steps before it comes, becomes a law. However, uh, based on the near unanimous support so far, it is widely anticipated that it will be adopted this year. Uh, and everyone who holds data uh, on European citizens is affected, even if you're not located in the EU. And there are fines for non-compliance, and that could cost millions of dollars. I, I think this is actually a pretty interesting um, uh, statement here. Under the proposed legislation, if you suffer a breach of personal data, you can incur fines of up to $100 million, or this is, this is where I think it gets interesting, 5% of annual turnover. Uh, plus, you have to notify the affected customers of the breach with all the associated costs and the loss of your reputation. And uh, the best way the best way to avoid a data breach is uh, just is not uh, persist data. If you must use isolated persistence or encrypt it. We'll we'll talk more about that whole point later. And then so finally, uh, 
I, I, I think this is interesting too. I do have a lot of conversations with people and, um, and it's not just a credit card number or a social security number that, that needs to be protected. Um, these are just some examples of things like, um, you know, date of birth, birthplace, IP address. A lot of this stuff just your marketing teams probably are collecting. All right, so we're going to do, uh, it's after lunch. Um, our smooth talking voices are probably lulling you to sleep <laughs> a little bit here. So um, everyone stand on up. We're going to do a little short demonstration here. So everyone together. Okay, let's start with an easy one. Uh, if you have a Mac, please sit down. This is information that's sent every single time you visit a website uh, whenever you're browsing. Okay? Uh, next. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, both of my neighbors should be sitting down. Uh, next, uh, sit down if you celebrate your name day. This is, if you don't know what that is, then you don't need to sit down. Okay. We found the Spaniard. <laughs> I'm sorry? Okay. Um, that's information that Facebook collects on you. Um, and next, sit down if you were not born in February. Again, this is information that Facebook collects. Not. not. So if you were born in February and you don't use a Mac and you don't celebrate name day, then you should be standing up. And you can see how rapidly we've segmented uh, this audience just based on some very broadly collected public, uh, personally identifiable information that um, everyone from Facebook to regular websites are collecting. Um, and that's part of why it's important to collect, or not, not to collect. <laughs> that's why part of why it's important to either avoid collecting it or to encrypt that data because it can identify people so individually. Uh, when Netflix held a challenge to do mining on their data set, uh, they actually tried to anonymize the data and people were still able to figure out some of the individual users in the anonymized data set based on some of the ratings that they had given um, and the trends and, and uh, sort of um, uh, aggregation of uh, the rating values and the uh, in individual numbers of the users. So it's amazing how much uh, individual identity you can harvest out of um, relatively anonymized or seemingly impersonal information. You guys can sit down now. <laughs> yeah, you can sit down now. <laughs> we'll make you stand at the rest of the time. <laughs> so let's go through some, um, some essential security steps. Um, these are going to be kind of the, now that we've talked about having a security consciousness, um, the defense in depth approach. Now we're just going to start getting into the, the nitty gritty of it. And um, first things first, keep a backup. Um, this should be going without um, having to be said, but more and more it has to be. Um, use a backup. If you have a service like Pantheon, set it for automated backups and you'll never have to worry again. Um, <coughs> personally, I've, uh, I have had a site that um, I got an email from a client frantically saying, oh my gosh, I screwed something up, what do we do? And I'm sitting here holding my six month old son, feeding him a bottle at five o'clock in the morning, and from my phone, I was able to reset the backup and re get the site back up and running within like five minutes. So a backup is a very, very powerful thing to have if you know how to use it. If you do roll your own backups, uh, there, it's important to segment the access control so that a hack of the website doesn't result in someone being able to also delete your backups. Uh, if you use something like S3, for example, you can create a key that is restricted to only creating files so that you can have your web servers be able to push their backups without the ability to delete them. Next, um, again, these should be pretty basic, but if you're not already, use some sort of version control. Gets the best one out there to do it. Um, so that way you can know that your code's been changed. Um, in the event of a hack or a breach and all of a sudden you, you think something's going on, or you just hit get status at some point on your server and a file has been changed, you're not the one who's changed it. Um, and so that's a good way of seeing who's changed, or uh, not who, but what's been changed, where it's been changed, and being able to uh, version control that and roll it back uh, is an important step. 
And uh, while we'll talk about passwords and two-factor authentication in a moment, uh, the best defense against reuse of passwords and the picking people picking bad passwords and having those passwords shared among multiple sites is to not have people use passwords on your websites, within your organization, and to minimize the use to the absolutely minimum essential uh, necessity for that. Uh, for your end users, that typically means social authentication. Uh, there are plugins for Drupal and almost every other content management uh, system out there where you can have people log in with Facebook or Twitter or Google or GitHub or a litany of other services depending on the type of user base you have. Every user that signs up for your site that way is, is not only going to be able to sign up faster, but they're not even going to set a password in your system. There is no password for you to leak if they sign in that way. If you're an organization or you're working with corporations, there are enterprise login tools and protocols that you can support where a user can go through a kind of confined gateway that enforces policy and doesn't require them to put in their password everywhere. Uh, again, that makes a great um, addition to security because it means there is less to even steal from the site. But uh, you do probably have to use passwords some places. Um, here's the kind of well-known XKCD um, comic on some of the password uh, combinations that people can create. So um, it's sort of advice of don't be the, one of those websites that has one of those needlessly uh, strict password policies about which special characters you use and how you format it and what combination of capitals and not because you're not actually helping your users create great passwords. Uh, if you are training your users or working with your own agency, uh, recommend people install many of these free password management options. Uh, here we have 1Password, LastPass, and on the open source side, we have um, Password Store and KeePassX. Um, almost all of these have mobile apps that work with them, desktop apps that work with them, good browser integration, and password generation so that you can generate good passwords keep them securely, um, and not use the same one over and over again. Because as I was mentioning with the foothold, um, it's not the fact that your recipe collection site got hacked that causes the real damage to people, uh, or a site that you signed into like that that causes the real damage. It's the fact that they recover the password from the recipe site that people are using, and it's the same one they're using at their bank. I always like to say the best password is one that you don't know. Um, I use one password all the time. I don't know half my passwords. Um, I just create them. I know my one master password, and that's all I need. Um, so definitely, if you are looking for something to secure yourself, go grab one of these. And uh, in combination with passwords, it's great to add two-factor authentication. Um, when uh, This is often gets added as part of a password-based login, where the next step after logging in with the user and password is providing the second factor. It's also sometimes used where it's just before a security-critical workflow, where, for example, on a site, you could set things up where creating a new node may not require someone to get their second factor, but deleting nodes might uh, uh, to do those kind of uh, more dangerous operations. Um, and two-passwords uh, two two is not two-factor. Uh, it has to be a combination of something you know and something you have uh, or something you are. Um, and typically, it's something you have and something you know. Uh, the password being something you know, um, something on your phone being something you have. Uh, and uh, this would have been able to prevent a number of issues um, for pretty famous hacks, like Target's hack would have been totally preventable by adding two-factor authentication, uh, and the Firefox SSH vulnerability if someone's keys got captured would not be an issue if you had a second factor when you're SSHing, because mere, merely possessing one thing is not enough. And one thing to think about in this entire, um, as you're building your site, is that you're not alone. Your site is not alone. It used to be. You used to just have you know, flat HTML that sat on a server, but now your server, your site, is talking to other servers, other sites, other services, um, and many a times the, the breaches or the, uh, the hacks that occur occur from a, uh, an API source or from some sort of uh, external uh, communication. So know that you're not alone, and so if you don't need it, Keep your hands off of it. Um, this goes for everyone who raised their hand that they're doing um, some sort of e-commerce site. Um, the PCI regulations are getting stricter and stricter, um, and unless you have 
you know, hundreds of thousands up to millions of dollars to spend on doing PCI um, audits, which I don't think all of us do, um, then we don't need to worry about it because uh, Stripe, Recurly, Chargeify, PayPal, they all have options where all of the card data is sent directly to the <laughs> provider. They provide you with an authentication token that you can then use, but that token is not identifiable to anything or um, anyone. And the credit card companies do not consider the identification token that one of these companies gives you to be credit card data. Correct. So, uh, And those provide you the ability to do recurring charges, to do... Um, to allow someone to recheck out at a later date with the same card that they put in before. Uh, and in the case of some vendors like Recurly, uh, you can even request them in writing to give you all the card data if you want to move between companies. So it's not necessarily vendor lock-in to do this. Uh, every one of these is PCI Level 1 compliant, uh, and you can build off uh, all of the investment they've made in sequestering that data uh, to make your services uh, less likely to be compromised in terms of log or logs or databases or caches. Also, um, we're finding more and more that key management doesn't necessarily just mean encryption key management. Um, most of us here use one of these services, if not multiple of them, on a site that you would build for just a regular small site. Um, if somebody had the key to your MailChimp account, they could send emails out with your brand on it. Um, that's not a good thing. Uh, and so more and more now we're seeing these API keys are going to be, and already are, uh, points of attack. I do have to say, though, within Drupal, we do a very, very, very poor job of managing these keys. Um, the form API gives you a password field. Um, the only thing that that does is give you the pretty little dots when you type your letters in. Once the data goes to the back end, it's not encrypted, it's not hashed, it's not anything. Um, a good example of that, and we have a, a patch... Um, for it now, but the SMTP module that you use to send email out stores that email password in the clear in your database. Um, there are multiple, multiple versions of this happening. Um, all the commerce modules stored in rules configs, which are all in your database. So these API keys and tokens are just sitting there for anyone to touch. And it also does very little to encrypt it with a key that is equally available with the data. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, if you have your Drupal salt, which is in the same database, encrypting with that doesn't really help uh, you prevent much of a breach because a breach of the database still gives them the key so they can, down they can decrypt it. So um, we're going to go through kind of the steps on how to secure your stack. Um, we're going to go from the hosting layer all the way out to your team. So, uh, yes, um, and we're going to walk through each of these layers in a way of at least how we approach some of it on the Pantheon side to prevent uh, compromise of these parts of the stack, as well as what some of the best practices that our customers do to protect their system, or to protect their website when they're already on top of a stack that uh, is designed that way. So uh, the biggest thing you can do to prevent a kind of cascading, festering wound sort of attack is to isolate the website itself. Um, uh, we've seen all too often some cases in the past where uh, the website has gotten compromised, which provide, and then the server got compromised, and that server had credentials or other things to access other servers, and because they put them all behind the same firewall or didn't have them properly segmented with firewalls, uh, or even just had reusable credentials, even if they weren't behind the same firewall, uh, it allowed a kind of um, foot-in-the-door attack where the website has to be pretty much publicly available unless it's an intranet. So uh, you really don't want to compromise the site to be a foothold for doing further compromise of an organization. The next thing to do is, of course... Um, uh, be securing your operating system. This is kind of the, uh, once you've gotten above the hardware and VM level, uh, this is the kind of genuine kernel of all of the security uh, that's happening on these systems. you got to install the security updates. If you're not monitoring for that, then um, there are all sorts of vulnerabilities that can crop up over time since, when, since the time you deployed a system. You want to automate configuration uh, so that whenever you are deploying new servers, all the things that you got right once, you're, you will continue to get right with those new systems you deploy or when you're replacing a server. Uh, you also want to make sure that you're um, doing quick updates for these servers so that when you have to respond quickly to a vulnerability, um, it's not something where you, you have to wait uh, a couple weeks until a sysadmin comes in and is able to do that for you. Uh, and you also need to be managing 
you know, of course, your firewalls, um, your remote shell access, who has elevated privileges on the boxes. Um, and also, a lot of people don't think about this, but being able to find compromise when it's already in that festering stage before it's become a full-blown organizational problem is important too. And there are rootkit detection tools you can use that are free, as well as package verification is usually built into the operating system. And you can periodically run that and it will tell you about anomalies. It will tell you what configuration files are not the ones that shipped with the package. It will tell you which files didn't ship with the package. And when someone is starting to put their kind of claws into the OS, this can be an early warning sign. Uh, next, we have the kind of web server itself, uh, which is running the application and providing the kind of HTTP access to that. Uh, you want to um, be sending headers down to the browser that prevent some of the uh, most common forms of compromise. Most uh, browsers support headers like X-Frame options uh, or um, strict transport security or um, things that, uh, or cookie options that are HTTP only. Uh, and so when you're setting those headers properly, uh, it means that one type of attack on the uh, content management system doesn't necessarily um, snowball into an attack uh, of any other website that those people are logged into. Um, of course, you want to be logging things. You want to um, prevent um, some forms of fingerprinting to see if things are vulnerable. You want to lock down those private directories that might, um, in a you know, if you're not using key management, have some secrets in them. Um, and deploy something like a web application firewall or CDN, where certainly when cert some attacks get detected or get found, uh, mitigation can go in there first, sometimes before you're able to actually do full QA on an update for the, for the content management system itself. And your database. Um, uh, distros are getting pretty good about this. It's pretty hard to have a default password. Most distros actually um, force you to set one at install time or have something where they don't have one set at all. But if you do have a default or you're using some package from a source that might set one, um, definitely change that. Uh, fire wallet so that uh, password is not the only barrier to entry because often people set passwords that don't get rotated or will get compromised. Um, and secure your backups uh, of the stuff where um, the, uh, the database itself is not the only way to compromise the data in the database. If someone gets to your backups, uh, that's almost exactly the same data. Uh. All right. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about data encryption. Um, currently in Drupal, there uh, is no native way to encrypt, that, in, encrypt data without a bunch of modules. Uh, and many regulations say, like the EU regulation that we looked at earlier, that if you have properly encrypted the data, you are not financially responsible for a breach notification. Um, and all of these modules up there, except for the encrypt user, um, we're, we're happy to say uh, all have D8 versions. So um, do you have anything you want to add on that? Yeah, so um, the new one to this mix is key. Um, in doing the most recent update to encrypt, um, Myself and another developer, um, R.L. Hawk, uh, or Rick Hawkins, uh, we were going through the encrypt, and, and uh, he added a configuration management to encrypt, uh, and we started thinking more and more about it and said, why don't we have kind of a central station for keys in Drupal? Um, this will make it much easier for us to regulate how they're used, where they're used. Uh, and so we created the key module, uh, and it acts as a central hub for all your keys. Uh, we have patches out there for all the major um, modules from e-commerce to SMTP and such, um, so that they'll all start using this as their central store, and it gives you options that um, range from okay to secure. Um, and so uh, definitely go check out Key. Um, it is currently in dev slash beta, and it should be released this week. Um, there's just a couple of small things that we're, we're tweaking on it. So. so yeah, even with all of those modules that uh, were just up on the screen, they all uh, basically suffer uh, the same problem, whereas the key for the encryption uh, is in your settings file or your database file or you know places that are not secure. Uh, essentially, the key is taped to the front door. You can have the strongest lock on the planet, but if the key is right there, it will be able to be unlocked. Um, there's compliance regulations that call for encryption and 
and key management. Um, and there are standards and best practices. Uh, in the United States, we have NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And even uh, over here in uh, Europe, they often point to that because they do uh, a, basically a definition of what should be a best practice. And um, uh, back to the title of this presentation, uh, key management is fundamental to a defense in-depth uh, approach to sec uh, security. So um, talking more about API keys, using something like the key module allows you to keep all those API keys in one central location. But some best practices around that are don't share your API keys with developers that don't need access to them. Um, I, I will openly admit I've done it once, uh, and I will only have to do it once, but um, how many times has somebody pulled a site uh, database from live back to development and forgot to change the emails or forgot to turn off that rule that sends out an email and all of a sudden you're blasting emails from a development server to production users. Um, so make sure that you have um, systems in place where developers aren't using your production keys. Go get, almost all of the systems will give you uh, development keys or development environments. If they don't, go create a dummy one and use that for your development and then switch it to production when you need to. Um, use per developer and per key uh, or per system keys, so don't share the same keys so like sharing the same password. Um, and then most off, off-site key management is the best way to, to um, manage your keys. Uh, if your key is not taped to your front door, and in Drupal that means in your database or in your file system, um, then it becomes much harder for somebody to, uh, to access those keys and use them against you. Um, also, it gives you more ability to regulate who's using them and where they're using them. So uh, with that, uh, Cellar Door and uh, Pantheon are announcing today that um, we are launching Locker. Uh, this is a new system that will be available to users of Pantheon exclusively right now. Uh, and it is a off-site key management that is built into a Drupal module that is built into key. So you enable the key module, you enable Locker, uh, and your keys will automatically start getting sent off and stored securely in an off-site database. It leverages Pantheon's public key infrastructure on the platform to ensure that there's secure integration for the key management. Uh, so it is actually aware of what Pantheon environment you're working with so that you can set up keys that work exclusively in the live environment as well as separate keys that are used for development and testing purposes and are only of, uh, and uh, this isolates uh, in, com in conjunction with Pantheon's change management tools, uh, it isolates the production keys away from developers who have restricted permissions. And one of those, uh, and along those lines, uh, with that, those keys aren't available for a developer to take with them. Um, if you are in a position where you have high developer turnover, um, you have developers that are external to your company, um, if you have a copy of your database that gets walked off with, uh, they have all of your keys. Uh, luckily, Locker... Uh, prevents that from happening and makes sure that um, the keys are used in the environment they're supposed to be used um, and only with the people that, that should be using them. And, and I'll just add one more thing about this. Uh, just a quick plug for you guys. Um, <laughs> totally free for developers. Yes. So that's uh, that's the other thing. Right now um, we're, we're launching into beta. Um, and so during that time for developers, it's 100% free. Uh, it's available today. Um, go check it out, try it out, kick it around, um, and definitely give us feedback if you have any, any uh, feature requests. Users have also asked about sanitizing databases as they take it back from the live environment, and this also offers a, um, an alternative mechanism for doing that where if you encrypt the data in the live database using a key that is only available in the live site, then taking that encrypted data back to the test or development or another environment, uh, it will, that data will not be available. Uh, it'll just be in the encrypted form and the key won't be accessible. So um, next step up is Drupal, um, which we're all here for. Uh, just keep it updated. Um, don't let something uh, go festering for, uh, for a long time without getting the updated. And don't get creative with permissions um, and whatnot. I always see sites I come to um, that I'll take over and there's 20 different roles and 30 different permissions that are set and it takes one checkbox out of those hundreds to all of a sudden um, give somebody access to something they shouldn't. So um, keep it simple, keep it updated. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, there's uh, security announcements that are regular on Wednesdays for that. Um, so look for those. And then also um, contrib module security. 
Uh, every time that you install somebody else's module, you are trusting their code to run on your site. Um, so active and popular plugins are most likely to have um, higher uh, security scrutiny. If there are uh, issues, if you're a module maintainer, uh, we've had this uh, happen on the encrypt module. There was a, um, an unsafe cipher uh, that we needed to remove. Uh, the security team will, will contact you and walk you through the process of, of putting out a security release. Uh, but do look at the contrib modules. It, just because somebody else made it and it's on D.0 does not make it secure. Um, you, need to, you need to audit everything you put on your site. And uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of attacks uh, exploit the human factor um, through, um, <clears throat> through confidence building, through social engineering, uh, through people uh, just, uh, just trying to get their job done and not wanting to jump through security hoops. So it's important to have security that works with your team. Um, one of them uh, that I mentioned before is using kind of single sign-on tools where you can create a policy bottleneck where you can make sure that everything people are signing into, including the website, including dashboards, uh, is handled through single sign-on. Um, on Pantheon, we support this through uh, SAML on our enterprise product uh, that allows you to set up that type of policy and deploy it to a team. Um, that allows enforcing things like two-factor authentication and strong passwords. It's important that you secure the devices of your team. Uh, the reason that passwords got compromised at Sony was because they had a, a file that was a master file with all the passwords in it. Uh, and it's extremely easy with, with tools like Google Drive and Dropbox to have people synchronizing that down to their devices. Um, so enforcing policy on what people can put on their devices, what they can sync down to them, how they encrypt them, how they put pen codes on them, when they lock uh, is important for the security. Uh, um, you're all clearly here at a conference. What happens if you left your laptop around and it went missing? Not because it was stolen, but because you might have just left it somewhere. Um, building security consciousness among your team is important, just as it is to create streamlined um, policy and implementations for this. All right, so we're, we're uh, short on time here, and I want to make sure that uh, we give some time for questions and answers um, before we're done. Um, so there's a couple more slides here. Um, we will post these slides. Um, these are um, some interesting um, insights into the Drupal Geddon attacks and how uh, Pantheon was able to monitor those um, and uh, how it's consistently going on um, through, you know, various vectors um, and you know different sites um, are targeted constantly for whatever reasons. Um, and so, yeah, so we'll, we'll kind of skip through these. Um, one really quick thing to note is if you get hacked, don't panic. Um, the first thing you need to do is um, notify uh, the authorities um, or follow the procedure if you're with a uh, organization like a university or a government that has certain policies. But then roll back uh, immediately or as fast as you can so that you can get back to a stable spot. Um, review and then um, make sure that that review has actionable steps to go forward with that you're going to uh, that you're going to be able to use next time. So, um, sorry we kind of cruised through that last piece there, but I wanted to open up uh, in case there was any questions, or so you guys can get to your next uh, next session. <laughs> And I think there's a microphone back there yeah. um, because they're recording so, these. So we need to go around. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, so my question is simple. So last year we had, probably everybody knows here, uh, Drupal 7 had that problem. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Drupal Geddon. <laughs> and uh, I know that Pantheon had very, uh, very interesting measures. Uh, would you like to? profound that a little bit more. I don't know if I was a little bit late on the session. So Okay. Uh, so um, what we did on Pantheon is uh, because we realized that it was a compromise, uh, it was a vulnerability in Drupal specifically, we run certain PHP before every request on Pantheon. That's to set up the environment. It's to handle uh, platform integration. Uh, and in the case of Drupal Geddon, we added... Um, code that we deployed to all the websites on the platform to analyze the incoming request, uh, to look for the telltale signs of something that was trying to exploit Drupal Geddon, and then to deny the request before Drupal actually started any processing on it. So that before a site had been updated to actually um, avoid the attack, 
um, most of the cases would get mitigated. Uh, we can actually hop back real quick to um, the slide here. Um, we did some analysis of uh, when it was coming in, and what we did is we have a kind of stats platform, uh, a foundation for our systems. We typically use it for platform monitoring rather than specific things for sites, but we set up this uh, mitigation measure to actually ping our stats collection uh, with, with a specific um, event uh, for the Drupal get in attacks that we detected and blocked. And almost exactly seven hours after the public announcement of the attack, we started seeing a massive uptick in, in uh, the attempts of the attack. Uh, it was actually done alphabetically by domain. Uh, so we, um, we, it looks like someone pulled um, publicly registered domains, and then they were iterating through those, and they were fingerprinting them if they were Drupal. And if they were Drupal, they were trying a Drupal get an attack. Um, fortunately, it looked like for most of the major attacks that uh, happened, um, or most of the, the scripts that people wrote, that they were effectively detected because we didn't have any reports of compromise, uh, even for sites that took a little bit more time than we would have liked to patch themselves. Um, and um, additionally, we did some proactive outreach to customers uh, where even after we did the uh, mitigation, we detected which customers had yet to apply the um, updates that were necessary, uh, and uh, we uh, contacted them to say, by the way, you should, I know we did this mitigation, but you should really patch this on your site. <laughs> and this is uh, from a, a Drupal Architect standpoint. This is why you go with a hosted provider, whether it's Pantheon uh, or any of the uh, managed hosting providers, is that you as a Drupal developer are not a sysadmin. You do Drupal development. Don't think that you can manage your stack properly. Let somebody else do it, and it's, in the long run, it will save you and your clients more money than, than trying to host it yourself. I'll name names. I know Acquia and Platform SH did um, preventative measures for this attack as well. Correct. Um, sometimes I've had requests from clients, the IT teams of clients, to take steps to prevent uh, the fingerprinting of Drupal. Sorry? There we go. There you go. I'll start again. Um, sometimes get requests from uh, clients or the IT teams of clients to uh, take steps to prevent the fingerprintability of Drupal. And we tend to advise that it's a bit of a lost cause because, A, there's about a million ways that you can fingerprint it, and the, to stop them all would basically mean not using Drupal. Yeah. And, B, looking through the logs... Um, you know, you, you, you see attempted attacks on, in, in the, the average Drupal logs on, on, for WordPress sites, for PHP My Admin. So the, the suggestion is that people will try and attack a Drupal site with a Drupal exploit, whether they know it's Drupal or not. Uh, that's what we tend to advise. Would you say this is good advice? Or? I, I would advise, so in terms of fingerprintability, I think it's probably more important to prevent version fingerprinting than um, software fingerprinting of what software you're running. Like, it's way more important for an attacker to know exactly what version of Drupal you're running than that you're running Drupal, because that determines what's patched, what's not patched. Uh, in a lot of cases, what these attackers are doing is they're hiring botnets, and they're hiring those botnets pretty much by the hour, and anything that makes their attack more efficient uh, is something that allows them to uh, compromise more sites more effectively. Uh, and so they'll often do things where they can just do the most... Um, uh, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be harder than the other ones they're trying to target. Uh, and so they might write a compromise where it tries to look for a changelog.txt, looks for the version that you have, and if it looks like you have a vulnerable version, then they attempt the more complex dance of, say, signing up for an account and then um, trying to create a node or whatever else is involved in actually orchestrating the attack. Uh, because they want to know whether you're vulnerable as quickly as possible. And if your changelog is not available, they might not even bother proceeding with the rest of the attack. Uh, I'm not suggesting that they won't, but like uh, it's all defense in depth. Every measure matters. Also, from a, a themer's point of view, um, trying to scrub your front end of everything that screams Drupal, i.e. views, panels, all that stuff, um, it's going to take you a ton of time. Um, and I think you're going to see diminished results as you more and more try to decrease that fingerprint. Uh, 
Yeah, you can, yeah, what he was saying was that you could download other files that have to be publicly available, yeah. and they have known changes to them, and then you can just figure out what version it is. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, guys. Um, not like a security person, like don't have a great amount of knowledge. I was wondering if you could uh, explain conceptually how off-site key management works, like specifically how the service knows if it's a legitimate request for a key versus an attacker who's compromised the system and is trying so to So in the, in the event of Locker, uh, the service that we're, we're doing, um, we're using the cert that is um, signed by Pantheon. Um, and so we trust and know their uh, certificate authority. And so when a request comes over, we look at that request and make sure that it comes from a Pantheon server. If it doesn't, it gets rejected out of the door right away. So there's there's some very simple steps that we put in place at the very uh, beginning to authenticate that. Um, and then we have uh, we have other methods of identifying the, the site, the key name, um, and all of those pieces to go actually retrieve the key. Um, but one of the most common questions I get is, why does storing your key off-site, but yet still an API call away, make it more secure than if it's on my database. Um, and to answer that, it's not every hack means that they have PHP control of your, your server and they can just start running arbitrary code. Uh, they could get a copy of your database from somewhere. They could get a copy of your code. Um, I was working with a, a Fortune 50 company and we had to sit down with the security team and the first thing they said is assume that the entire database and the entire code base is going to be read by somebody that shouldn't be reading it. Um, and so not necessarily running the arbitrary code but just reading it, you don't want those keys to be there. So it gives you that extra wall. Uh, but then also we have in place um, flood <laughs> measures and, and other countermeasures that say, okay, if somebody's trying to brute force this, and they they have um, attacked a site, and now they're just trying to strip every key that they can find. We can we can limit that and shut that off as well. Uh, and to provide a tiny bit more detail, in every certificate that Pantheon issues to a container, we embed the site identity and the environment. So they actually know on Locker that it's coming from the live site from a live site stack for this particular website, uh, and then that is how it uh, uh, retrieves the keys. Additionally, even if someone does get application control, um, it's it's all about that defense in depth and how much effort the attackers have to do. It might be that a script kitty, uh, which is basically someone who downloads an attack kit, uh, is able to obtain the database, and they may not be um, uh, experienced or capable enough of discovering the fact that they need to trick the site into making an API request for the key to decrypt the information. Uh, because that requires considerably more knowledge of the architecture uh, and a much more targeted attack. Uh, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be um, harder than everyone else to hack. And it's all about um, the, the defense and death approach. How many gates and how many walls can you put up? And if those walls are taller and harder to climb, then you can shut them off or, or kick people out of them. It, it also means that um, your backups are no longer vulnerable because the backups, right. um, if someone gets one of those files, that's a whole separate system. That's a whole separate set of files that people are handing around. Uh, and key management means that that, that um, system itself is um, protected against um, compromise of it alone. And interestingly enough, um, as Luke was talking about earlier with compliance, um, a lot of the times we hear, oh, you have to encrypt, you have to encrypt, you have to encrypt, you know, X, Y, and Z data. But what you don't see in that, um, if you read a little bit lower, it says you have to encrypt it and manage your key properly. And to manage your key properly, they'll state it has to be kept off-site. So just encrypting your data um, and keeping the key, even if it's on the exact server outside of the web root, still technically does not meet compliance in certain situations. So... Please be short because I guess everyone wants to leave. Yeah. First, Locker, is it open source or not? Uh, so Locker, the module piece for it is open source. Um, so that's going to be um, available for everyone to download, but it's a hosted service that we're running. Yeah, and th that's precisely my point. The backend, the hosted service. Your, Correct. Correct. This it's is a... your business model, so you keep it there. I mean, Correct. My, my long term problem is with the trust and with the choice. Correct. I am convinced now you guys seem to know your business, so <laughs> I go for your service. Yeah. But tomorrow you got recruited by one company, and they got recruited by another, and I don't have any idea who takes over. So is Correct. it possible that the back end is actually open sourced and we can implement it and we can actually examine the people that are taking care of our 
security. So there thing? are there are open source um, key managers that you can deploy in your own stack. Um, but the reason why we're hosting it and we're managing it is because um, one of the we've been we've been working in key management in Drupal now for a couple of years and talking to a lot of people in the community. And the two things that come up most are cost. Um, and so Locker is going to be introducing at thirty dollars a month. Um, whereas most key managers are on a magnitude larger than that. Uh, and the other one is just time and effort. They, to run your own key manager, you have to put it on your own uh, server. You're going to be the one managing it and everything else. So for us to manage it, um, it's all there. But the, the actual um, functionality of that key um, and where it's being stored and whatnot is not going to be open source. And from the Drupal perspective, from the model, how yep. much uh, does it look you to your service? No. Uh, one of the great things about the architecture of this is the key module Correct. allows you to use any backend you want to write that follows Key's API. Correct. So what ba uh, um, they've been great about this in the sense of it's um, it's sort of like backup and migrate, where uh, there are completely open source uses of it. People can write their own backends for it, uh, and while there may be one hosted backend with a with a provided integration, it's actually shipped as a separate module. Uh, yep. You get the key module, which is totally open source, and you can write any backend for it. And then there is the locker backend for the key module, where anything that the key module stores goes into um, those APIs. And you can export your keys back out of locker. Um, so if you want to take it to a different provider, uh, and the key the key module itself, be, we built it to be that central hub. So at any point, you could say. I don't want to use Locker anymore. I want to change it to a different service provider or a different method. Um, and as long as it's a, a it's a C tools plugin, so as long as there's a C tools plugin for it, you can put a, any any back into it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. You will be the Pentium uh, boot. I would. Yeah, we'll we'll be around um, at the Pantheon. I, will, booth. I have several. I'll certainly be at the Pantheon booth. Yeah, he'll be at the Pantheon booth, and we're Thank we're you. around Thank there quite you. a bit too. I think we need to back up. Yeah. Yep. I think uh, if there's any more